All right, all right, all right. Age of Empires 4 has just come out and I have been playing it far too much and having way too much fun. I've come up with a couple of quick tips in this video on how you can get started playing, as well as an overview of the civs to help you guys pick which one you want to play. This video is sponsored by Lenovo Legion. If you've played other Age of Empires games at first glance, this might look like not much has changed. You harvest resources with your villagers, you build armies, and you fight your opponent. However, with every single game I play, I'm more and more convinced this game stands on its own as a new and unique experience. I think the main reason for this is it's embraced a lot of city builder mechanics, which have a range of bonuses based on building placement, different abilities that can stack together in creative ways, and other options that in general move the focus of the game away from mechanical aspects onto the strategic choices. So if you're an RTS veteran, a lot of your experience still carries over, but it's going to be a lot easier to get into if you're new to RTS, as some of the obstacles to the genre have been removed. Coming from a StarCraft background myself, the slower battles have been a really nice welcome change of pace. And instead of focusing on the micro aspect of controlling my individual soldiers, I'm noticing that I've got a lot of room to improve in the strategy and economy management areas of the game. Let's get into the Civ overview to help you pick where you want to start off. The English have early access to the powerful longbowmen, as well as very strong melee infantry with some very, very strong upgrades for their men at arms. They're also backed up by cheaper and faster food producing farms, which makes the English early game just beginner friendly. Rather than having to risk moving out of the map to harvest dangerous food sources, you can simply get into your farm economy very early with those farms placed nicely around defensive buildings, which by the way, give you a huge bonus. Defensive buildings buff the attack speed of nearby units, your villagers also have bows to defend themselves, the only civilization which has this, and your town centers fire twice as many arrows as the other civilizations. So not only is your early game great, but the combination of the longbowmen, as well as spearmen to help defend them from enemy cavalry, creates a beautiful early game army. If you make some rams with this, you are going to be able to take the fight to your opponent with a feudal age ram, spearman, and longbow push. It's a great build to get started with. The Franks are an awesome cavalry civilization. The Royal Knights are super impressive. They have a bunch of bonus damages and their charge is huge. It does massive, massive damage. Not only are French knights constantly raiding your opponent's villages, causing them trouble and hunting down any exposed workers, you've also got the shielded Arbelatrier, basically a super crossbowman, and you've got powerful keeps, which you can put those down near your archeries and stables to actually give a big discount on any units produced from those. The French also have a wide range of economy bonuses with all of their economy upgrades being cheaper and their villages building faster, just makes French a very smooth civilization to play. The Holy Roman Empire bases its economy boosts around its prelates. You can build these right from the start of the game and they preach the good word to your villagers and motivate them to work a lot harder. You also have superpowered men at arms with specialized upgrades, as well as the famed Reglet's Cathedral, which triples relic gold income, means aiming for a fast castle age and grabbing those relics is a sure path to victory. Don't forget as well to use your emergency repairs ability to rapidly heal a building from near death all the way back to full life. Mix the Landschnacht into your army as well, it'll deal massive area damage with their two-handed swords, though they are very fragile to enemy archer fire. If you enjoy side quests, you're definitely going to enjoy the Rus. As the Rus, you hunt down wild animals, you get bonus gold, as well as you boost your bounty. That's a rating, which as you hit certain tiers, it boosts your food income. You have access to the unique Horse Archer, which gives an incredibly flexible mid-game. Super mobile, it can run away from bad fights, harass your opponent's reinforcements or their villager line, and in general, it just gives you this nice flexible ability to choose when and where you want to fight your opponent in the middle stages of the game. You also have access to the only mounted monk in the game and can learn some absolutely game-changing wallalos. Oh my god! My opponent doesn't know about that ability! What a Yep, in case you hadn't heard, the monk's conversion is a huge area of effect in this game. This is something which breaks everyone's brain the first time they realize this, but it does require your monk to be holding a relic to use, and it's got quite a big delay before it goes off. The Mongols are the only civ that can't build walls or keeps, but who even needs it? You can just pack up your entire base, move it whenever you need to. Uh, the center of Mongol power is based around the Ovu. Now the Ovu automatically harvests stone and you can then invest that into pretty much anything. It can give you unique upgrades, it can get, let you build double units for free. Uh, it just gives you this incredible flexibility so you can pick which direction you want to go as a Mongol player. 
You also have the YAM network, which means your outposts create an aura that buffs the movement speed of your units. Especially useful since you're usually cavalry focused and you're often doing hit and run tactics. You use your Mangadai, which is a, an archer on a horse that can of course move and shoot at the same time. And you even start off with a Khan, a unit which respawns if you ever lose it, and it gives signal arrows. So it can shoot an arrow in the air, basically a giant buff. It either gives movement speed to nearby units, attack speed, or armor. And you combine all of that with the Yam network, the mobile nature of the civilization, you're going to drive your opponents absolutely insane with the harassment that you can put out. The Chinese is a deep and incredibly flexible civilization that can deploy a wide range of exploding units. Not only do you have the fire lancers with their explosive points, the grenadiers that throw grenades, and the nested bees that just shoot awesome firework explosions, but you also construct buildings at double speed. You have access to both landmarks in each age, and it, once you build both of those, you enter a dynasty, which unlocks some of these unique units as well as other bonuses. Don't forget to use your Imperial officials. You can boost production by overseeing resource drop-off points, and you can collect valuable taxes that actually stack up on those resource buildings every time a worker delivers some resources. Initially, we thought China was really defensive civilization because you're trying to optimize stacking all these cool little economic bonuses, but lately people are figuring out how to use the Imperial officials boosting army production to actually make some very powerful aggressive moves. I think basically the civilization is just so complicated, there's so much to explore and discover, and you can really bend the Chinese civilization to the way you want to play the game. Delhi is another very advanced and unique civilization. It is based around the fact that every single upgrade is free. Every single one! But they do take far longer to upgrade. Much, much longer. And they're only boostable by building up your religious scholars and housing them in mosques. As such, you're usually playing for a longer and more defensive game plan. You're trying to buy time for those upgrades to kick in as the Delhi. To help back up this uh, kind of soft spot of the civilization, your military can actually construct forward walls, something which normally villagers have to do, and you gain access to a free weapon emplacement on all of your defensive structures. Once you get into the castle age, you can train powerful war elephants to give your opponents a massive problem on the battlefield. Quite literally, I lost almost all of my early games against elephants, and I've seen so many people on social media going, how, how do I deal with elephants? So have a lot of fun building these, and, and you're gonna cause your opponents some problems. Delhi's also very powerful on hybrid maps. That is a map with water and land. So if you've got shared bodies of land, say of water, say rivers and lakes, your fishing boats actually defend themselves as Delhi. They can fire arrows even while harvesting fish. So defends themselves from any enemy trying to burn down the dock or them trying to take the water off you. And you can also then grab these fishing boats, run them over and sink your opponent's fishing boats while also harvesting fish right next to them. The Abbasids seek to enter Golden Ages, which gives them significant economic advantages. They do this by getting buildings stacked up around the House of Wisdom, and as they get more and more of those, they can enter those Golden Ages. The Abbasid have camel units, which are an exceptional counter to enemy cavalry. Their docks are much cheaper, which gives them a good head start on water maps. Land traders are a little cheaper. But one of the best aspects of Abbasid really is the fact that you just don't need to make siege workshops, nor upgrade siege engineering to construct rams, springholds, and mangonels. It means that you can basically just always use an infantry army because only infantry can construct these things, which is why you don't use cavalry much as Abbasid. But you basically get a big infantry army on the front line, you build up rams, uh, springholds, mangonels, a whole bunch of siege, and you just surprise your opponent. There, There is very little foreshadowing. Suddenly, bam, you just build a big siege army to support your infantry, and you're already smashing through your opponent's base. Now that you've chosen your civilization, here's some tips to get you started. First off, economy is absolutely key in any Age of Empires game, but especially here in Age of Empires 4. You want to frequently shift your villages from one resource to the next to find the right balance. Your main resources are food, wood, and gold, with the bonus resource, stone, only really being used for making extra town centers as well as defensive fortifications. So you want to make sure you choose a composition that uses a mix of these resources. For instance, knights are very food and gold heavy, but they're weak to spearmen. Archers cost mostly wood, and they do bonus damage to spears. So knights plus archers is a fantastic composition that's economically balanced, and it also covers each other's strategic weak points. Make sure you learn your civilization-specific bonuses. Every single civ has a whole bunch of bonuses that I haven't had a chance to list in this video because there's too many to point out. So look them up and make sure you memorize them. For instance, the English mill boosts the rate of nearby farmers. Likewise, the Rus Wooden Fortress gives a bonus to nearby wood chopping. Now let's talk about the one hotkey that you absolutely have to be using to make the game a lot smoother. The Idle Worker Key. I'll show you how I set this up on my Lenovo Legion 7 powered by an AMD Ryzen 9 processor. 
I hot key mine to this button just to the left of the number one, the tilde key we often call it, and I find that tapping it regularly is so useful. It'll take me to any villagers that are idle, I just give them a new job, and it makes sure my economy keeps rolling, I notice when any of my resources run out, and it reminds me to automatically ungarrison villagers or put villagers back to work if they had to run away from an enemy raid. Lenovo Legion are currently giving away a month of Game Pass for PC on selected devices. With that, you get access to over 100 game titles, including Age of Empires 4. So now is the perfect time to check out some Lenovo devices and to get on board and try out Age of Empires. This game has a strong defender's advantage that you have to make use of if you want to find success. On the defense, you want to pick your battles wisely. If you can't match the enemy army, always take shelter behind your town centers, your outposts, and your keeps and garrison villages or army inside of those where they can shoot arrows out of those buildings while you're defending. Use this time to migrate your villages into safer areas of the map, pull them away from any exposed resources where they might get raided down, put them on new resources in a more defended area, and bide your time until you can catch up on that army. On the offense, you also want to be careful because of that exact same defender's advantage. So don't just headbutt into town centers and outposts. Instead, aim to deprive your opponent of key resources that are exposed. Raid those exposed villages, look around the flanks with squads of cavalry or infantry to raid them. Even just forcing the villagers to run away to the safety of the town center or to garrison inside outposts is actually a big win because they lose a lot of harvesting time. It causes a very big disruption to their economy. And only once you have a lot of rams or siege weapons, only then can you really just smash your way headfirst through your opponent's defenses. Walls are a fantastic defensive tool that a lot of new players utilize, but probably a bit too much. Controlling the map has its own benefits. In Age of Empires 4, you've got relics out there. You can take those with uh, monks, put them back inside your religious buildings. They give you gold income. There's also valuable resources like boars, which are not lurable. You used to be able to lure these in older age games. They're not lurable in Age of Empires 4, but they have a massive amount of food that harvests way quicker than any other source. If a player is willing to control the map and harvest from more dangerous areas, they actually get a lot of benefits. Remember that Age of Empires 4 also presents multiple win conditions. So not just destroying your opponent's landmarks, but you can also build a wonder, a very rare win condition as it's incredibly, incredibly expensive, or they can hold all sacred sites on the map for 10 minutes to achieve victory. These sites also give you passive gold income, so capturing them is a great reward for controlling the map. So in this way, don't think of walls as a way of just hemming yourself in your corner of the map. Think of them as a bonus tool to help out versus aggressive players or to secure forward areas of the maps, things like those sacred sites for yourself. Don't just lock yourself in the corner of the map. I hope this video has helped you all out with getting into Age of Empires 4. Planning to do some more content, helping beginners get into the game, figure out the mechanics and some of the build orders. So drop by again in the future for some more videos.